Logan wants to congratulate you and oh. Maddie on the on baby Rosie. Thank you, Logan. Appreciate that. Also wants to welcome you personally to the coolest club on the face of the planet. There we go. There we go. What will we see first this year? T.Y. Hilton and one other receiver over a thousand yards, or the defensive line getting a combined 50, 50 sacks? Fifty sacks. Holy shit. My wife just texted me a picture of Rosie. Miss you, Dad. This is the first time I've been really, really away. Not What's your to, camera roll look like right now? Not to on get your phone. it has changed in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it has changed from like screenshotted funny barstool tweets right. to uh, to a lot of babies. So let me send this text. Miss you, Rosie. Not to get sappy on the pod, but uh, we got to go real life here. It's true. Um, all right, give, give give it to me one more time. Logan says Hilton, Hilton and, and another an, whiteout and another whiteout over a thousand. Or the defensive line getting 50 sacks? Um, Hilton in another wideout is, is is a much better chance of um, of that. 50 sacks is, a, is an absurd number. 41 last year. Forty Total, right? Total. I mean, he's saying just D-line. Yeah. I, I will... I am willing to guess the Indianapolis Colts have never reached 50 sacks in it. In a single season. So, Logan, I just think, I'm not saying like Hilton and another wideout having a thousand is easy. It is not easy. I'm not like acting like you just fall out of bed and, and do that. But um, let me look up last year's sack. So, so you said 41? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. I got it right here. So, just D line, okay? Mm-hmm. Houston had 11. Sheard, four and a half. Autry, three and a half. Stewart, three. Muhammad, three. Banigou, two and a half. Ture, one and a half. That's 29 just for the D-line. You're 21 more on top of that? Let's go. I mean, DeForest Buckner, somebody, but I mean, that's, boy, that's um, that's a lot, Logan. I can't I can't go there, man. Neither are very, very likely, but far and away, I, I would say another receiver having 1,000. Lawrence wants to uh, wish you a happy belated Father's Day. Thanks, Lawrence. So let's say the Colts are waiting to see how Marlon Mack does this year with Taylor before offering an extension. How much do you think a reasonable offer would be to keep the running back duo together for the next few years? Yeah, I mean, a really good question, Chris. Um, I I think they will wait. And I I think they might wait on all these extensions, just COVID-related of like salary cap. But with Mack, I guess the first question that I would have is like, what is the market for Marlon Mack? He's 23, 24. That's great. Um, he doesn't do much on third down. That's not in his favor because I feel like there is an element of like, if you're going to be a top 10 running back in the league, unquestionably, you got to give me something on the passing downs. Um, you know, I could see something of like six ish million, seven ish million for Mac. Maybe that's a tick high. If I'm the Colts, I could probably make it work for about five million. And obviously, if you're the Colts, I would think you'd want to bring him. I don't think five million would be totally like, nope, the cap situation's way too dire. Now, if the cap is restricted in any way, maybe five billion becomes a lot more precious to you. Mm-hmm. But like, no matter what happens at quarterback, it's not like the Colts are shelling out five year, 120 million anytime soon for a quarterback. I, I just, I, I don't know yeah. how that would be possible. Um, Maybe Bill O'Brien will trade, you know, Deshaun Watson to the Colts for, you know, Jack's Donuts or something. Like, it, it's basically, I think from a financial stance, you're in decent shape. My question is, why would Marlon Mack want to come back? I think that is the honest conversation that I feel like not everyone is having. Like, it's not what can the Colts do to try and bring him back. You've got to put yourself in that guy's shoes. This is a two way street, and running backs are a total different breed. When it comes to the second contract. But that is that where I sent you a list last week? The amount of running did, backs yes, that are yes. coming up. Bring that up. Maybe go that ahead. maybe that go maybe that helps the Colts in terms of negotiation. Guys on one year deal right now, you have Dalvin Cook, Aaron Jones, Derek Henry, Leonard Fournette, Joe Mixon, Alvin Kamara, Kenyon Drake, Todd Gurley, James Conner, Damian Williams, Kareem Hunt, Tariq Cohen, Marlon Mack, Chris Carson, Jamal Williams, Matt Breida. Yeah, some very good names. So if he doesn't if he doesn't get one of those contracts first, do those dominoes fall quicker and then he kind of is forced yeah. to come back to the Colts? It, it, it's a good point. I probably haven't given it as much attention as I should, but I think there will still be some team. Like some of the, like Todd Gurley, it's a miracle that he found what he found this year. 
I think at the age of 23 or 24, what Marlon Mack has proven in the NFL, I think one of 32 teams will give him six to seven million and the lead back role. He's not going to be the lead. Like, Jonathan Taylor's taking 41st overall. Folks, unless he's Rashad Penny or Ronald Jones, like, you draft a running back from the top 50 in the past few years, they usually succeed and they usually need the ball a lot. So, I just think Matt can find that elsewhere. And this is the only time he's going to get paid. Mm -hmm. This is it. I mean, if he can go get two, three years for 20, okay, three year, 21 million versus two year, 11, a little bit of higher guarantees from the Colts, like that might not be worth the risk for him because who knows when you're going to blow out that knee. So that's, that's how I look at Mac. And I also just feel like at running back, Anything less than like ten million, or anything more than ten million invested in that group is probably a little bit too much for me. Okay. Which the nice thing is Taylor's obviously on that rookie contract. Yeah. Eric wants to congratulate you again on the birth of Rosie, and he wants to uh, hope you're letting <laughs> Mama Bowen get plenty of sleep. So, which <laughs> I mean, great advice. Yes, that is great advice. We are. What's your best Rosie story so far? He wants to know if, if it's something you'd be able to tell. Oh, gosh. Wow. Um, boy, that I'm willing to share. Boy, I hope my wife, what are we? My wife usually doesn't listen. We're about, what, 30 minutes in? There's there's no way she's listening this deep. Um, <laughs> like I said, I, I'm, I'm seeing hours of the night that I haven't seen in quite a while. And, like, you know, when you wake up at 2 or 3 a.m., it's kind of like neither her, my wife nor me is functioning at a high level. We're both speaking just gibberish. She's like, you know, you go down there and grab this. And I'm like, yeah, 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 I will. And then I come up and I bring like salt and pepper when I should have brought like, you know, something to help Rosie feed. Like, I mean, just, I, I'm just totally off my game. Um, I would say, I guess before I touch on the story, I've never been a big believer in coffee. I drink it maybe once or twice a month. There, maybe. Goes, a there goes a potential sponsorship. Yeah, I know. I shouldn't have said that out loud. But I'm open to it now. <laughs> I'm very open to it now. Let me let me tell you, I, I now uh, understand why, why why people are like, yeah, uh, give me a, a, a um, what do they call it, an IV Keurig and just strap me up for the day yeah. with about seven cups. Um, I would say this, Father's Day, wake up, whatever, 1 a.m. I have no idea if it's Father's Day or what, whatever. My wife's like, happy Father's Day. I'm like, thanks. She's like, will you go change Rosie? I'm like, yeah. So I go across the hall, change her, and um, Rosie has mastered the the delayed releasing of her of her waist. Um, so, and not to get too graphic, but whatever. We're all family here on this podcast. You know, you, you're undoing the diaper, and like you think, okay, there's what she has deposited out. Okay, good. Um, you got to have fast hands, and boy, some of my hands have been a little slow a few times, and. Man, she'll come out five or ten seconds later and be like, "Yeah, Dad, uh, you weren't quick enough. Here's another surprise." Right. And boom, I'm like, I'm I'm the slow middle line. But no, at times I'm the fast defensive end that doesn't read the draw play and gets way too upfield. And Rosie's thirty yards by me, and I'm I've just opened it up. But I will say, on Father's Day in the afternoon, I I knew it was coming, and uh, she wasn't gonna get by me. And I read it, I attacked it, I captured it all, Perfect. got it locked in there, and I let out. I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a loud yeller in watching sports. I haven't yelled much. I yelled during the Belmont Stakes, won, won a little bit of money on that there on Saturday. Go. But I haven't yelled a lot uh, in a while. And, I mean, I yelled out, a, yes, let's go. <laughs> I mean, I was I was pumped. Oh, I mean, I was like, I got it. And I captured it. We didn't have to use another diaper there. So, um, yeah, she's got this little delay trigger to her that uh, – it's kind of like, all right, I could be five seconds. I might be 15. I got I, I, fresh air. I might, you know, be willing to let it out a little bit more. So, yeah, sorry if that was too graphic. No, but, you're, uh, you're learning. Yeah, I, you know, I channel my inner Anthony Walker. Read it, okay? Dissect it, okay? Draw play, sit in your gap, read, react, and come in, and boom, fill it, and let's go. <laughs> there you go, Eric. Oh, man. Sorry if that was too much. No, it's great. If Philip Rivers becomes an elite game manager, do you think the Colts could use could have a 49er like season if TY or Campbell get hurt again this season? Could you see Hines starting to line up at wide receiver more like Christian McCaffrey? Mm. Who is that Trenton? 
Trenton, yes. Trenton, that's a good... Well, I will say elite game manager. Is that an oxymoron? <laughs> like, elite game manager. I, I don't really know if that's... Uh, uh, Joe Flacco, the elite game manager. Uh, Chad Pennington, the elite game manager. I don't really know if that's the most flattering comment. But having said that, I do I do get what you're, what you're saying there. I think I referenced game manager earlier for uh, Rivers. Um... Could have a 49ers like season. I'm sorry, but like uh, the 49ers had a D line that was just was just incredible. I, I I don't you know the Colts aren't having that. Are you going to give them Nick Bosa, DeForest Buckner, and Eric Armstead and D Ford and uh, Sheldon Day and all? I guess they have a couple of those guys, but certainly not all of them. Um, I think that it. Um, I I I don't think they can get to. I don't think it's just Philip Rivers being an elite game manager all of a sudden could equate to a San Francisco type of run. I think more things have to happen. Your defense has got to take a big jump. Your O-line needs to continue to stay healthy. Your run game needs to continue to be consistent when you're playing the top rushing defenses. So I think it's if you're going to get to the Super Bowl, it's more than Philip Rivers just being an elite game manager. Like, there, I think there's more. I mean, we're talking the Super Bowl here. We're talking a 10-point lead in the Super Bowl. I mean, we are, we are talking... You know, pretty close to the to the top of the Super Bowl or NFL mountain, I should say. So I think it's going to take a little bit more than that. And I guess I'm a little bit torn on last season with with the Colts and like how to view that season. You know, so many people are like, "Man, seven and nine, one possession losses, and man, if that kicker was just competent, it would have been ten and six. And, and I hear that crowd out, and I also hear the crowd that's like, seven and nine, how many one possession wins?" Yeah, like there were a ton. I mean, Tennessee, Denver, um, Houston at home. I mean, there were a lot of one possession wins early in the season where they could have gone the other way. And yes, you would like to think your kicking game improved, but you also had this just incredible and rare offensive line health that you're inevitably not going to get this season. So I, I don't think we can just go off of like last year and just be like. Oh, without a doubt, the kicker will be better. The quarterback will be better. Here's 11 wins falling out of bed. Like, it's just not that easy. Um, Hines line up in the slot. Sure. It, it would take injuries. But, um, yeah. Another over-under. This one's from Corey. If set at one and a half, would you take the over or under on the number of players from Ballard's 2017 draft class? That will still be on the Colts roster in 2021. Oh, man, that's a, that's a really good one, Corey. Are you Corey Zidonis, high school teammate of mine, tremendous golfer, winner of the 2008 Individual <laughs> Golf State Championship, assistant coach at IU, tremendous. Great golf course down in, in Bloomington, I hear. Um, if set at one and a half, boy. Gro- Grover Stewart, to me, will get the second contract, so there's one. Okay. Now we're debating. We already got four guys gone from that draft class, so, yeah, so there's re- your one. Re- read those four off if you have them. Hooker, Max, Stewart, and Walker are the, are are, the four remaining yeah, from that four, draft Yeah, four class. remaining. The Gons are Wilson, Banner. Ba- Basham, Hairston. Basham, Hairston, yeah. Those Jets. Um, Walker's the biggest debate to me. I, Hooker, I believe, is gone, and I would say Mac is whatever, you know, closer to being gone than, than coming back. Walker's just such a tough debate. You know, I, I, I could see it both ways. Yeah. Um, I'll go with over, but man, I don't feel totally confident. I don't. I don't on that. I was listening to Ballard um, on a podcast last week. Maybe it was a couple weeks ago. I don't know. All the days kind of seem <laughs> running together at this point. But um, you know, Ballard's such a fascinating interview. And this goes back to the Grigson thing that I think is such a great quality for a GM to have that I don't think Grigson ever got there. And Ballard has gotten there and, and publicly admits it. You know, he's not afraid to do that either. You know, you don't have to do that, but I think it makes the fan base and certainly the media helps you out from a content standpoint. But, like, basically Ballard says he kind of drums down his prospects of, do you love football and are you a good teammate? And if you do that, we can probably get over some of the other things. Um, And he also admit that, like, that he is, I don't know how much he's grown or how much of this, this philosophy has been instilled in him from an early, you know, scouting standpoint, but like he basically has said, like, I'm not smart enough to do this on my own. I'm not. So I need to surround myself with people that will challenge me, will help me, will 
be eyes and ears to an operation that extends far outside of just your little bubble in the back room of watching film at West 56th Street. And he's humble enough to admit when enough is enough and, like, move on for the most part. You know, there are a few you could nitpick on, but it's, you know, Ballard, I think, is always a, how do you improve? How do you get better? Um, How do you keep getting better every day? If you're not willing to admit that you need growth, like, and I don't think every GM in the league thinks like that. I just yeah. there's just this title, this walking around with you know what you think is bigger than everyone else's. You know what, like it's just, and um, I think Ballard has he's willing to do, and that is such a critical, critical piece for any managerial position, regardless of industry. And Ballard has that. And that, uh, that's another reason why I think you feel better about things moving forward. I know that's not tangible wins and losses, but that is an element to his leadership that I think is just easier to gravitate towards and why people believe in him more. I mean, when you can check your ego at the door. Oh, it's huge. Huge. I mean, it's <laughs> monumental. Why, why have these scouts? Why? Yeah. You know, why, why if you're going to be a, if they're going to be all yes men to you, and you aren't going to listen to their opinion, why have them? That's uh, ignoring and totally overpaying for 18 people in your organization or however. Like It's a collaborative effort, and he's he's open to being challenged, and that's huge. All right, Suarez wants to put Rosie in the GM seat. Oh, whoa. What would Rosie think about Ballard giving up next year's first-round pick and Malik Cooker for Jamal Adams, the Jets seem to love our defensive backs. Oh no, 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 no! Rosie Bo saying no, and not just because it rhymes. Um, no, first round pick. Yep. Yeah, I, I'm. Do, I'm not doing that for a safety. I'm not. I'm not doing that. Play and Hooker. Uh, I mean, that seems to be quite the package. Granted, Hooker's probably walking anyways. But again, people need to need to. I understand these questions, but first off, didn't Adams come out with a list of teams? I didn't see the Colts on it. We were not. It was like seven teams, and we did yeah. not make that cut. Um, I still have this like thought in the back of my mind of like I want that first round pick for a future quarterback. But like that's where I'm thinking, mm-hmm. and I just think the Colts are kind of saying like I don't know how much. It, it, it's weird in a way they're saying I don't know how much safety means to this defense, but yet they've invested. I mean, think about if you were to trade. A first round pick for Jamal Adams. That means in the Chris Ballard era, you have invested two first round picks, a third, and a fourth at safety. That's absurd. So I'm not, uh, that to me is a luxury upgrade. I like Adams to a degree. Don't know if I love his fit, but, um, and aren't you going to have to pay him? Yeah. You know, you're going to have to pay him a healthy chunk. And um, we just rattled off. Nelson, you're going to pay. Leonard, you're going to pay. I mean, how many, what, 12 starters are free agents this year? Uh, no. No, no, no. And I think Adams could be a bit of a loose cannon. Yeah, you talk about locker room. Like, what did you say about Ballard, the two? Are you a good teammate? Yeah. Are you good love, at football? Uh, do you love football and are you a good teammate? Yeah, I don't know how, how, how the good teammate works. I know there's an, uh, there's an amount of friction you want to have, but that seems to be a 465 size friction. Nate wants to know if you could pick one wide receiver core from the state of Indiana to be the Colts for the next 10 years, would you take the Colts, Purdue, Notre Dame, or IU? Feels like this is the most talented wide receiver wide receiver core across the state in a very long time. What a question. Boy, Nate's mind. Um it, it's a it's a really interesting question. I will say it's a very obvious answer. It, it is the Colts. I mean, Paris Campbell and Michael Pittman are 22 years old, and they were drafted in the second round for a reason. Um, having said that, Purdue's wideout class of Rondell Moore and David Bell is uh, is a bit. In, do, does IU have good wideouts? I guess I should know. I went there. Um, I can't say I really follow IU football very closely. Um, I feel like they have like one good wideout every year. Yeah, but like I, none of them. I mean, Cody Latimer gets drafted. That's like it. Uh, Notre Dame lost Claypool. Kevin Austin, I hope, can stay out of trouble and be the real deal. But yeah, Col- uh, yeah. P- I mean, Pittman and Campbell are still young. Like, uh, yeah. I mean, you're gonna lose Hilton for the next ten years, but uh, two 22 year old guys that were drafted in the second round. Sign me up. 